Methodology. This research uses genealogy and normative theory to reconstruct and analyze feminist critiques of liberal democracy, contemporary feminist approaches to democracy, gender inequality, and gender justice. Genealogy, as a method of historical critique, is especially suitable because, in contrast to conventional historiography, which presupposes a linear scheme of progressive history, genealogy's critical historical narrative explains a phenomenon or event by showing how it came into being by unpacking the relationship between power and knowledge. The focus on the interplay between practices and discourses reveals how language does not simply mirror the world, rather, it shapes and interpellates it. The genealogical method helps understand how systems of thought and knowledge are governed not only by grammar and logic but also by rules that operate beyond the consciousness of individual subjects. These define the structure of conceptual possibility that determine the limits of thought in each domain and period. Genealogical analysis uncovers how a given system of thought results from contingent turns of history and is not the outcome of rationally inevitable trends. This method enables a philosophical historical criticism of present thought and praxis and is thus adequate to our research interests and goals. In addition, we draw on normative theories as they enable us to explore the foundations, principles, and justifications of systems, relations, and practices. It helps examine the underlying values and theories that inform concepts and ideals and their moral and philosophical implications. This approach is distinct from descriptive, explanatory, or empirical research. Normative theories provide frameworks and criteria for evaluating and correcting existing systems, relations, and practices by highlighting their shortcomings and envisioning potential improvements. For instance, in the history of political ideas and political philosophy, there are different perspectives and approaches to normative democratic theory, inequality, and justice. In what follows, we consider new understandings and standards to evaluate and appraise prevalent practices and approaches. Drawing on normative theories, which provide invaluable impetus for critically examining and refining concepts and practices, we outline how to pursue more just, fair, compelling, inclusive, and legitimate democratic governance, gender equality, and gender justice. To this end, we first reconstruct prominent feminist positions on democracy from an Anglo-European perspective. We start with the historical theoretical analysis of early 20th century feminist theory, followed by focus on contemporary theories and interventions from Western and non-Western scholarship alike. We map the temporal and spatial framing of concepts and problems as well as how they travel between different regions. This approach helps us to understand the current conundrums and challenges within scholarship and activism. In addition to reconstructing feminist criticisms of liberal democracy, we also present a critical analysis of prominent approaches and normative proposals put forth by feminist scholars from the global south. Secondly, we reconstruct key contributions of different feminist traditions to intersectionality theory from non-Western approaches to better understand gender injustice and global inequality. This augmentation of the canon allows us to understand intersectionality as a corrective methodology. The shift of focus to the co-constitution of multiple categories and the critical evaluation of the dominant paradigms employed in scholarship and research enables. 5. A better understanding of diverse inequalities and their entanglements with disparate social hierarchies. In the final section, the focus is on the project of a feminist utopian ideal of gender justice. We weigh some common obstacles that arise along the pursuit of gender justice as well as numerous normative dilemmas such as struggle it faces in a new age of democracy. The concept of utopia encompasses the desire for the qualitatively new. However, this is not merely abstract or ideological in terms of invoking a general normative ideal. Rather it is the form of imminent critique that enables material and symbolic change to achieve gender equality and justice. Introduction, Gendering Democratic Theory from an Intersectional Perspective As a form of collective exercise of political power that guarantees parity of participation to all members of society, gender equality is crucial to democracy. Democracy is as much about citizenship rights, participation, and representation as it is political parties, elections, and checks and balances. The quality of democracy is determined not only by the form of its institutions but also by the extent to which different social groups can participate as members of these institutions and the public sphere. Since 1979 the European Parliament EP, has claimed to be a key promoter and fierce supporter of gender equality. 
It has one of the highest percentages of women parliamentarians worldwide, and its multinational composition is unique. The seemingly progressive position on gender equality does not hold up under closer scrutiny. Contemporary feminist analyses reveal several critical facets of how political representation is gendered across countries, political groups within the EP, and other organizational branches, as well as its real impacts on recent changes in the EP structures, policies, and practices. The overrepresentation of men in the EP, in the national parliament, as heads of state, and in significant political parties translates into discrimination against and obstacles for women. For example, women have greater misgivings about standing for election, their campaigns often receive less funding than their male counterparts, who spend less time on childcare than women across the EU. To prevent democracy without women, policies to foster women's rights and to increase women's participation in parties, the judiciary, civil society, and the public sphere are imperative. The absence of women and other minorities and marginalized groups from the public sphere and political arena results in democratization with a male face or in a male democracy, an incomplete and very biased form of democracy. In the global north, democratic rights were initially enjoyed by property-owning white males and only extended to women and the rest of the male population much later, due to struggles from below. In the global south, the expansion of women's rights has often been part of decolonization processes in which women's mobilizations have played a key role. Contemporaneously, democratization and women's rights movements are closely intertwined and mutually dependent. Separating the two is conceptually misleading and politically dangerous. The importance of gendering democracy rests in the interdependency of women's rights with substantial and effective citizenship, political participation, and representation. In scenarios when a party or a group based on patriarchal norms comes to power through free elections, women are relegated to second-class citizenship. Women can pay a high price when a democratic process is launched without strong institutions and firmly established principles of equality and the rights of all citizens. The decline of democratic institutions and practices is detrimental to justly substantive female representation. Thus, the recent democratic backlash in European countries such as Poland has negatively impacted women's representation. A democratic system excluding women's political and human rights and gender equality is a deficient form of democracy. The turn of the 21st century marked a shift towards a participatory approach in public decision-making, accompanied by introduction of the new public management measures. This shift, however, bears a neoliberal character, with financialized capitalism, bureaucratization, and commodification of public action being the norm. In response, feminist theory presents a critical intervention, advocating for intersectional perspectives, social justice, and sustainability. Feminist movements have a history of promoting decentralizing, anti-hierarchical, and internally equal participatory processes to democratize the political, social, and economic relations and structures. Feminist praxis aims to promote citizen participation in order to achieve sustainability of life rather than as a functional tool for furthering political and economic interest. Additionally, the feminist critique of democracy outlines how women and other genders have traditionally been excluded from the democratic system, thereby failing to establish equality. Therefore, feminist movements have significantly contributed to contesting social and political structures of domination and democratization processes. Drawing on these insights, this report is divided into four main parts. It begins with an introduction to notions of anti-feminist and anti-gender movements, backlash theory, and democratic backsliding to briefly map the current challenges and obstacles faced while pursuing gender equality and justice in Europe. This entails hostility and opposition to feminist advancements, the erosion and attack on women's and lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and intersex, LGBTQI plus, rights, and the weakening of democracies and their institutions, mainly resulting in the deterioration of democratic principles and the debilitation of the rule of law. The second part delves into feminist engagements with normative theories of democracy and the framework of liberal European democracy. This part reconstructs key feminist arguments and criticisms of liberal democracy and furnishes tools to transform it from within. This part is divided into two sections. The first one reconstructs some prominent classical ideas and theories of democracy promulgated by Western and non-Western feminists in three main fields, citizenship, participation, and representation. 
The second section introduces significant modern feminist democratic frameworks, such as ecofeminism, social reproductive theory and care ethics, and queer and trans feminism. These broaden Western notions of democracy by introducing new concepts and perspectives, such as interspecies politics, caring societies, and disidentification politics. The goal is to outline how these critical interventions, ideas, and theories expand the core principles of liberal democracy to incorporate women's rights and gender equality from an intersectional feminist perspective, including LGBTQI perspectives. A feminist intersectional analysis of democracy, therefore, involves studying how gender intersects with other social categories, such as race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, nationality, religion, and disability, to produce specific forms of inequality and discrimination within democratic practices and processes. The third part addresses an intersectional understanding of gender inequality in the context of transnational and supranational inequalities, specifically in Eastern and Western Europe. This section engages with the crucial contributions of different feminist traditions to intersectionality theory. It outlines how these have enriched struggles for equality and justice, especially for marginalized subjectivities and communities, including racial and religious. One new public management, NPM, is an approach to running public service organizations used in government and public service institutions and agencies at subnational and national levels. The term was first introduced by academics in the UK and Australia. Minorities, colonial subjects, LGBTQI plus people, people with disability, and women. It reconstructs the significant contributions of non-Western feminist theories to intersectionality politics, such as black feminism, post-colonial feminism, feminist disability studies, and Roma feminism. The aim is to show how intersectional politics and intersectional corrective methodology contribute to engendering democracy. Against the background of global inequalities, feminist intersectional theories focus on the co-constitution of multiple categories enables a better understanding of the challenges of transnational feminist scholarship and activism. Finally, the fourth part explores the project of a feminist democratic pushback against the anti-feminist and anti-gender backlash. The final section engages with the concept of gender justice and the normative dilemmas that beleaguer the new age of democracy. Feminist democratic critical ideals of citizenship, participation, and representation reshape and inform alternative concepts of justice by reimagining democracy intersectionally. This entails a reconfiguration of norms in order to enable democratic recognition but also to transform the historical and structural conditions that produce and reproduce the misrecognition of women and LGBTQI plus groups as political agents. The challenge is ushering in innovative, normative orders for a new age of democracy that achieves and secures gender justice, assuring democracy for all. I. Anti-feminist and anti-gender backlash and democratic. Backsliding. Over the past years, processes of de-democratization across Europe have emerged along with opposition to gender equality in both theory and practice. It is notable that the attitude to gender equality often serves as a metaphorical seismograph that foretells the deteriorating situation of fundamental rights and values, including democracy and the rule of law, in a given society. Efforts to restrict or undermine women's rights frequently signify broader societal conflict. Scholars suggest that such tendencies to erode progress in women's rights represent the tip of the iceberg of a vaster phenomenon, which is accurately captured by the notion of the rule of law backsliding. In what follows, we will briefly highlight the connection between anti-feminist and anti-gender movements and the backsliding of gender equality policies. This will be followed by historical reconstruction and genealogical analysis of feminist theory of democracy and a focus on the shortcomings of liberal democracy. The effort is to contribute to the developing understanding of the historically gendered aspects of democracy and its contemporary challenges. In recent years, Europe has made significant progress in advancing women's rights and achieving gender equality. However, there has been certain pushback that indicates opposition to these progressive politics and policies. As feminism grows, so too do anti-feminisms, a multifaceted and complex set of phenomena characterized by individual, collective, and institutional opposition to gender equality. These counter-movements contest the ideas, policies, and people that make up the feminist movement. 
Anti-feminism is an organized counter-movement in and across diverse cultural and historical contexts that seeks to undermine and counteract the accomplishments of the feminist movement in economic, social, and political arenas. The anti-feminist backlash is part of a broad network of neo- conservative discourses and practices fed by misogyny, sexism, and chauvinism. However, it cannot be reduced to any of these. Anti-feminism is a set of beliefs, practices, discourses, actions, and subjectivities that promote mobilizations and attacks against feminist agendas to the detriment of women's and LGBTQI plus people's rights. Another widespread form of anti-feminism is the anti-gender movement, which questions the concept of gender, discrediting its notions as an ideology. Gender ideology is a discursive strategy devised by the Vatican and adopted by various actors to challenge feminist ideas and agendas for equal rights for women and LGBTQI plus people. Christian-based religious anti-feminism is pursued by both Catholics and evangelicals. These forms of anti-feminism decry the social and moral instability allegedly triggered by contemporary feminism. Two key factors contribute to the emergence of this type of anti-feminism, the Vatican's opposition to both the agenda of the Cairo Conference of 1994 and the Beijing Conference of 1995, as well as the Catholic Church's growing support for mobilizations against the decriminalization of abortion and equal marriage, especially in European countries. A good example is the anti-feminist and anti-gender backlash against reproductive rights, which guarantees women choice by ensuring access to safe and legal abortion. Some conservative groups have sought to restrict or ban abortion, often framing it as a moral or religious issue. The backsliding of these policies can manifest as restrictive laws or policies limiting women's autonomy over their bodies. Poland's Conservative Law and Justice Party has actively pushed for stricter abortion laws. This led to mass protests and international condemnation. Additionally, in Poland and Hungary, there has been opposition to comprehensive sex education and attempts to undermine women's rights organizations. Another relevant example is the case of Hungary, where the rise of conservative and nationalist ideologies has often clashed with feminist movements and institutions. The government, led by Prime Minister Viktor Orban, has been criticized for promoting traditional gender roles, limiting the rights of LGBTQI people, stigmatizing the term gender, pushing for withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention, and banning gender studies programs in universities. These movements and actions, however, are not limited to Eastern Europe but are also prevalent in Western countries. In France, anti-feminist backlash targets head coverings and other religious symbols. Bans on religious attire, such as the controversial Burgundy ban, restrict women's freedom of expression and reinforce anti-Muslim racism. This debate has raised questions about secularism and women's agency, focusing on the violation of women's freedom of religion. There is growing hostility in Spain toward gender equality policies, particularly against the law on gender equality, enacted in 2004. Certain conservative and far-right groups, like the Vox Party, have criticized the law, arguing that it promotes gender ideology and undermines traditional family values. They also disavow the existence of gender-based violence against women. In Germany, far-right political parties, such as Alternative for Germany, AFD, are increasingly mobilizing against LGBTQI plus inclusive sex education and pushing to protect the white, heteronormative family. In Austria, where the conservative far-right government was in power for about two years, the anti-feminist agenda had devastating implications for feminist organizations and advocacy. Regrettably, these agendas persist to some extent in the new government coalition of the Green Party and the Austrian People's Party VP. For instance, in the ethnicization of gender equality and provisions and legislation on protection against violence. These are just a few examples of how feminist backlash theory critically examines the hostility and opposition to feminist advancements, which challenge traditional gender norms and power structures. As feminist movements gain momentum and push for gender equality, there is often a reactionary response from individuals and groups who reject these changes, i.e., those who benefit from existing gender hierarchies feel threatened by the ostensible loss of power and privilege. As feminist movements challenge traditional gender roles, expectations, and inequalities, they can create anxiety and engender antagonism from those who uphold and benefit from these sexist systems. 
This animosity may manifest in various forms, such as cyber, bullying, trolling, virulent stereotyping, delegitimizing feminist arguments, or even actively working against feminist goals or women's and LGBTQI plus rights. Anti-feminist backlash can occur on both an individual and an institutional level. On a micro level, people may resist feminist ideas and actions because they perceive them as threatening to their status, identity, or beliefs. On a macro level, backlash can occur through policy changes or social practices that seek to roll back feminist gains or undermine their legitimacy. This backlash is not a universal or inevitable response to feminism but rather a social and cultural phenomenon that varies in manifestation across different contexts and historical periods. Backlash can be influenced by a host of factors including cultural conservatism, economic crises, and political ideologies, to name just a few. Understanding backlash is important for analyzing local and global power dynamics as well as advancing transnational gender equality. Susan Faludi introduced the notion of anti-feminist backlash in her influential book, Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women, published in 1991. Faludi's theory explores the phenomenon of societal backlash against feminist advancements and the push to roll back women's rights and gender equality. As Faludi explains, the backlash is not a conspiracy, with a council dispatching agents from some central control room, nor are the people who serve its ends often aware of their role, some even consider themselves feminists. For the most part, its workings are encoded and internalized, diffuse and chameleonic. Not all of the manifestations of the backlash are of equal weight or significance either taken as a whole, these move overwhelmingly in one direction, they try to push women back into their acceptable roles, Faludi, 2006, page 13. While her analysis primarily focused on the United States, it has been applied widely and in various contexts, including Europe. According to Faludi, as women's rights movements gained visibility and made progress toward gender equality, there arose a backlash from conservative forces that sought to maintain traditional gender roles and power dynamics. She claims, the anti-feminist backlash has been set off not by women's achievement of full equality but by the increased possibility that they might win it. It is a preemptive strike that stops women long before they reach the finish line, Faludi, 2006, page 11. This backlash aims to undermine feminist achievements and restore traditional gender norms. Faludi identifies several key components and strategies of anti-feminist backlash, which primarily includes media misrepresentation, wherein the media often portrays feminism in a negative light, distorting its message and trivializing women's issues. Anti-feminist backlash often employs scaremongering and fear-based tactics. This suggests that feminism threatens societal values, family structure, and economic stability. Another tactic is individualizing women's concerns, which are then dismissed as personal problems rather than systemic or structural issues. The burden for addressing gender inequalities is shifted onto women, diminishing the need for broader social change and accountability. Another approach is the co-optation of language, in which anti-feminist groups appropriate feminist language and concepts while distorting their meaning or using them to advance anti-feminist agendas. Finally, political antagonism and opposition to feminist policies and legislation involve efforts to dismantle or weaken laws promoting gender equality, reproductive rights, or workplace protections for women. In the face of these pushbacks, numerous individuals, organizations, and governments in Europe are working tirelessly to counter them and protect women's and LGBTQI plus rights. Many countries have implemented policies and initiatives to address these challenges and promote gender justice, recognizing that achieving true equality benefits society as a whole. However, the erosion of fundamental rights and freedoms in certain EU countries has resulted in the deterioration of democratic principles and the undermining of the rule of law. Democratic backsliding harms progressive norms and practices and is characterized by the breakdown of democratic institutions, the undermining of judicial independence, the weakening of checks and balances, restriction of media freedom, and the infringement upon fundamental rights and freedoms. In recent years, dissatisfaction with democracy has sharply risen. Among the reasons driving this discontent are economic crises, polarization, corruption scandals, inept governance and gridlock, and citizen perceptions of failed promises of democracy to deliver development and prosperity for all, IBID. 
the number of people living in autocracies has increased from 46% in 2012 to 72% in 2022, with 43% of the world's population living in countries that are autocratizing, moving away from democracy, Papeda et al., 2023, page 12. Autocratization Democratic backsliding and de-democratization are different names for the recent phenomenon of the slow erosion of democratic institutions. They refer to values, principles, and practices that have steadily been on the rise in the last decade. They differ from the rapid democratic breakdowns of the past instituted through military coups or revolutions in that democratic backsliding is a slow and gradual process of attacks on political institutions and norms, particularly the free press and independent judiciary. Democratic backsliding usually occurs in countries that have crossed the democratic threshold. In other words, this concept is relevant when describing, for example, the United States, Poland, Hungary, or India. However, it does not apply to Russia or China, where the concept of authoritarian resilience fits better, as Russia has never become a consolidated democracy and China has never democratized in the first place. Nancy Bermeo identifies three key varieties of contemporary democratic backsliding. The first is a promissory coup, a coup against an elected government that is organized with a promise to quickly institute. Nancy Bermeo identifies three key varieties. Nancy Bermeo identifies. Nancy Bermeo identifies three key varieties of contemporary democratic backsliding. The first is a promissory coup, a coup against an elected government that is organized with a promise to quickly institute free and fair elections, which rarely take place in practice. As this type of democratic backsliding is a rapid regime change, it aligns better with the concept of democratic breakdown than with what most scholars would consider a slow erosion of democracy. The two other varieties fit squarely into this concept of democratic backsliding. They are strategic manipulation of elections, gerrymandering is one case in point, and enhancing the power of the executive while minimizing the system of checks and balances. The recent COVID-19 pandemic opened more opportunities for the latter, particularly in weaker democracies. However, it is worth noting that the emergency powers of many executive branches remained constrained in numerous countries as well. David Waldner and Ellen Lust, 2018, page 95, define democratic backsliding as a decline in democratic qualities of governance. If a country shows deterioration in two of the three dimensions of democratic governance, participation, competition, or accountability, then it can be considered a form of democratic backsliding. Democratic backsliding also differs from the rise of right dash. Wing populism, as the former occurs at the institutional level. Right-wing populists, however, often drive these institutional changes. Right-wing populism is a political ideology combining right-wing politics with populist rhetoric and policies. While variations across countries and parties can be identified, some common characteristics are often associated with right-wing populism. Five main features are nationalism, namely, these movements often emphasize national identity. Secondly, they have a strong anti-immigration stance, they adopt a strict stance on immigration policies, calling for tighter border controls, limitations on refugee intake, and the protection of national culture and identity from perceived threats posed by immigrants. Thirdly, there is a strong sense of skepticism towards the European Union, such that right-wing populist parties are often hostile to the EU and its supranational institutions. The fourth trait is punitive rhetoric, as they advocate stricter law enforcement, harsher penalties for criminals, and stern measures to protect citizens from perceived threats to public safety. Last, but not least, is an opposition to political elites, which often involves strongly rejecting established political elites. Populist leaders position themselves as anti-establishment figures, criticizing mainstream political parties and portraying themselves as the alternative, deploying populist rhetoric to appeal to the concerns and frustrations of the general population. Right-wing populist parties and their leaders are at the forefront of undermining democratic institutions by capitalizing on the dissatisfaction and anxieties of people with the political system and the erosion of individual economic and social prospects. In addition to these aspects, further reasons for democracies to backslide are coalitions of political elites who radicalize and polarize populations to maintain electoral gains and stay in power, only aggravating this process. 
Alternatively, Wendy Brown sees the seeds of democratic backsliding in the intersecting logics of neoliberalism and neoconservatism in that they produce citizen consumers willing to accommodate the management of everyday life and are complicit with the state being run like a firm, page 705. Finally, democratic backsliding in some Central and Eastern European countries results from bringing leaders into power who reject and resist the perceived hegemony of Western liberalism. Over the past years, trends of de-democratization across Europe and the Americas have emerged along with opposition to gender equality and threats to previous achievements in gender equality policy. Within this context, scholars suggest that such tendencies to prevent the progression of women's rights are part of a vaster phenomenon. A similar trend is noticeable in the phenomenon of the rule of law backsliding, which refers to the process under which a country, previously committed to upholding the rule of law, erodes or undermines those principles. It involves a gradual or deliberate regression in protecting and enforcing legal norms that can harm democracy, human rights, and governance. This is the case of Hungary and Poland, where governments removed checks on their power, eliminated independence, and failed to honor their European commitments. In such a context of de-democratization, gender equality comes under attack along with other democratic values, such as fundamental human rights and the rights of vulnerable and marginalized groups. While significant attention has been devoted to democratic, of law, backsliding, there is a striking lack of research In such a context of de-democratization, gender equality comes under attack along with other democratic values, such as fundamental human rights and the rights of vulnerable and marginalized groups. While significant attention has been devoted to democratic and the rule of law backsliding, there is a striking lack of research into its gender characteristics and implications, that is, into the very concept of backlash against women's rights. Such backlash is part of a broader project that contests the global gender equality norm, which has expanded internationally since the 1960s. Over the past few years, there has been a rise of highly coordinated, well-funded, organized anti-gender and anti-feminist movements, dangerously undermining the achievement of gender equality. Behind these movements is a powerful religious, anti-women lobby fueled by right-wing populist politics, growing nationalism, and conservatism. These movements not only incite intolerance and hate against women and their rights and against LGBTQI plus people, but also encourages support for regressive laws and policies running against international and human rights standards and commitments on gender equality and non-discrimination. For example, they sabotage struggles against gender-based violence as well as the promotion and protection of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Against this background, the feminist pushback against the backlash is a multifaceted response that seeks to challenge and overcome hostility toward feminist ideals that undermine gender equality. It aims to counteract anti-feminist politics and protect and promote all individuals' rights and well-being, regardless of gender, class, race, ethnicity, able-bodiedness, or religion. To contest anti-feminist and anti-gender backlash and democratic backsliding, one feminist pushback strategy is to focus on democratic theory and practice. A society with substantial equality requires actual citizenship for and the participation and representation of all.